In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Okay, if you know the golden arrow. May the most holy, most sacred, most adorable, ineffable, and unutterable name of God be forever praised, blessed, loved, adored, and glorified in heaven, on the earth, and in the hells, by all of God's creatures, and by the sacred heart of our Lord Jesus Christ, in the most holy sacrament of the altar. Amen. Our Lady of Fatima, pray for us. St. Joseph, pray for us. St. Gregory the Great, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. So this second talk fits in well with the first one. We're going to go a little deeper, but it's also slightly different because we're going to talk about Catholic prophecy. So we already learned a little bit about the private revelation, the public revelation, all that makes up prophecy. When we talk about Catholic prophecy, we definitely want to understand that some of the prophecy is infallible and certain and de fide and was revealed by our Lord himself. So it's certain. And then there's others that could even be conditional prophecy. And with all prophecy, one of the things that makes it a little tricky is that it has to be interpreted. And so if you recall, we were looking at, from the first letter of Corinthians in the last talk, where St. Paul says that these gifts are given to the church by the Holy Ghost. Some are given the gift of prophecy. Some are given the gift of the interpretation of the prophecy. Interestingly, rarely does the same person get both gifts. So, for example, in many of the famous Marian apparitions, you'll have a seer get the vision, but authenticating it, judging it, discerning it, falls on the magisterium. And that's a wonderful sort of check and balance. You even have sometimes, for example, in the message of Our Lady of Akita, that she appears to Sister Agnes Asagawa, who is, we could say, the visionary, and then she also sent him, she also sent her, she, our lady says, a person who's going to be able to interpret things that she didn't understand. And so that became her priest, and a very important spiritual director for her. So these gifts are given, and they work together, and God uses them both. And in his wisdom, he uses them so that we don't misunderstand the prophecy. So I think that's the great, uh, there is something I think exciting about Catholic prophecy, because it speaks of the future, we like to know these things. But we can get ahead of ourselves, we can make some erroneous judgments, and we want to be really careful with that also. So that's what this talk is about. As I said, some prophecy is de fide, it's infallible, like when we read Genesis 3.15, that was a passage in scripture. The Lord God said to the serpent, I'll put enmities between you and the woman, and thy seed and her seed, and she shall crush thy head. That's certain. Our Lady will crush Satan's head, and she does crush his head. And because it's God's prophecy, it's not just like a one time that it's going to be fulfilled. Mary is crushing Satan's head many times. So this prophecy is not just about one particular event, although it may be about a very specific event, but it also plays itself out in many other places. And that's another thing that makes prophecy a little tricky, that it can be applied in many different levels. That's back to the fact that God's the Lord of history, and there's always these different types, and so the prophecies can apply in different periods and different eras and different times, and that's kind of what makes them so powerful, why they come from God. There's certain prophecies that our Lord gave us. If you read Matthew chapter 24, we will always read that around the last Sundays before Advent, even the first Sunday of Advent, these are the passages we read, that's certain. So some of the things we hear there, not all, but some, our Lord says, and many false prophets shall arise. They will seduce many. And because iniquity, or evil, hath abounded, the charity of many shall grow cold. But he that shall persevere to the end, he shall be saved. A few passages, a few lines later. For there shall then be the great tribulation, such as hath not been from the beginning of the world until now, and neither shall be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh should be saved. But for the sake of the elect, those days shall be shortened. And in the following chapter, we'll talk about how he's going to come on the clouds, the general judgment, and how he'll separate the good and the bad, the sheep and the goats. And the son he will cast into everlasting fires of hell, and the son he'll say, well done, my good and faithful servant, and you get a reward. 
So these are certain prophecies. We know these will happen. Everything in scripture is infallible, so we know what's going to happen. Interestingly, when asked about the message of Fatima, as well as the third secret of Fatima, Sister Lucia said, just go read chapters 8 through 13 of the book of the Apocalypse. That's what the message of Fatima is about. So for those people who want to know some of what Our Lady has been revealing as is very important for our times, we go and read chapters 8 through 13 of the Apocalypse. Some of it you may understand, and some of it you may scratch your head saying, what's being said here? So we get good commentaries and good help with that. Um, so basic concepts regarding prophecy. Uh, it helps to have a definition. When we talk about prophecy, it's the foreknowledge of future events. Though it can also apply to past events of which there's no longer any memory, or even to present hidden things, which cannot be known by the natural light of reason. So prophecy is dealing with things, generally the future, which we could not figure out on our own. <laughs> Human reason is not going to figure it out. You need God to reveal it. So it's coming from a divine inspiration. It has to be supernatural. It's infused by God. And only God knows the future. So real prophecy only comes from God. He keeps that hidden from the devil. So even though the devil has an intellect that is far superior to ours, a preternatural intellect, it is not supernatural. And God does not allow the devil to know the future. Now the devil's very intelligent. He knows a lot about human nature. He knows a lot about our weaknesses. He can perceive events that are taking place and how we're acting, and he can sort of play that out and sort of anticipate what we're going to do. And we each can do that. Every one of us can do that, right? We can do that with our children. We can do that with our spouses. If we know people pretty well, we even know, like we say, I'm going to push your buttons. I know I can go and say certain things and get you hot under the collar. Right? We can do that to each other. Or various situations, we've seen how people react, and so we can sort of predict that's going to happen. Again, that's the natural light of our reason. So that would not be prophecy. We can also see the natural outcome of things. We can sort of see if uh, you're spending a lot of money, and you're borrowing, and you're spending, and you're borrowing, and you're manufacturing money out of thin air, well, at one point in time, there's going to be a payment. There's a recompense coming. You know, economies are going to crash, right? We've seen that time and time again in our history where if we're doing, you know, funny things with our economy that shouldn't be done, then eventually there is the retribution. You have the natural consequences. So if someone predicts that this might happen or that a war might begin, that might not necessarily be prophecy, okay? So again, it's supernatural only from God. And then it has to be manifested in words and signs, because when God gives it, he gives it for the benefit of others. He gives it for the good of people. That's what prophecy is for. We just mentioned some of the reasons he gives prophecy in the previous stuff. And this is where it gets a little tricky, because it's a divine mystery that you can't know with your natural reason. But the purpose is for it to be able to be conveyed to others. So you're going to have to use human words, human imagery, human concepts to convey this idea to others which then means there has to be an interpretation, and that's where things can get a little tricky with Catholic prophecy and we often go astray. And that's where we do have to be careful. So it is built into the very nature of the thing. As we try to convey it to others, whoever receives the prophecy, there is the possibility for misunderstanding and misinterpretation. Because God's revealing something to the mind of the prophet, the prophet then has to reveal it and manifest to it to others. Again, why does God give us prophecy? Ultimately, it's very simple. It's on account of his goodness and his love for us. This is why God gives us prophecy. This is why you don't disparage it. Okay? It is because he loves us and he is good and he seeks our salvation. So he might give us some prophecy because it's necessary for our salvation. He might know that we need it. He might know that it's going to keep us away from sin or prompt us to do the good. So avoid evil, do good. That's one of the main reasons why God gives us prophecy. He may also want to warn us of coming chastisements. It may be a corrective. And if then, if you do not straighten out, then this is going to happen. Right? We have a great example of Jonah and the Ninevites in the scriptures of that. And that often happens. So he can warn us. He might also just want to strengthen our faith so that we really believe what he says is true. St. John actually lists that as one of his reasons in the gospel to strengthen our hope to persevere us in the time of difficulties, to increase our confidence in Him. This is really important because if we, for example, look at the scriptures more carefully, 
and we see salvation history, we see the prophecies God has made and how they've been fulfilled, it should begin to instill in us great hope and confidence in God. That's where Catholic prophecy can really help. So it is not meant to sort of be what I call the chicken little syndrome, where you think, oh no, this guy is falling, and everybody's running around scared, and you're always living with a certain anxiousness and nervousness that something terrible is going to happen. That's not the purpose of prophecy at all. It's the exact opposite. So let's not allow it to be used that way on us or against us, or don't fall into that trap. It's there so you can say, hey, whatever happens, no big deal. God has got it under control. He's already prophesied these things. This is going to happen. That's okay. All I have to do is we said in that first line uh, that I was reading from Matthew 24, he that shall persevere to the end shall be saved. So my job here is going to be to persevere, to persevere in faith and truth and hope and charity and the love of God and the love of neighbor. I persevere in these things that God has revealed. He's warning me about coming chastisements when they hit me. Yes, it's still going to be difficult. Yes, it's still going to be a cross. Yes, there's still suffering. Yes, it still hurts. It's not easy. But take great confidence. God has it under control. So that's really what I think the Catholic prophecy is really there. So strengthen our faith, our hope, and our charity. And again, do be careful because the devil will always try to get in there and mess it up and invert it. So that's where back to how private revelation must be carefully discerned. When it comes to prophecy, again, let's distinguish. So we do want to make sure we understand the difference between certain infallible prophecy and conditional prophecy. Sometimes people take a conditional prophecy and think that it's a certain one, and we don't want to make that mistake. And it's not always even necessarily that easy or that explicit, uh, depending on how the prophet speaks. So for example, if you look at, say, Vincent Ferrer, who was one of the great prophets, he saw many signs that the world could be coming to an end. And he was preaching as if the world was coming to an end. Now, it didn't come to an end, but many of his prophecies were actually conditional. Even if he didn't explicitly tell people. You know, we understand that sort of in hindsight. And that's the other thing about prophecy. Most often, prophecy is not fully understood or understood in the best way it's supposed to be understood until it's after the fact. So it's kind of ironic uh, because it is meant to prepare us for the future. But a lot of times, there's parts of the prophecy that remain hidden to us until they sort of happen. But again, remember, what was the prophecy there for? To inspire our hope and our confidence. So even in those cases where the prophecy isn't fully understood until later, it really inspires our confidence because we're like, oh, well, now it makes sense. And that then prepares us for our own trials. A great example of this is when our Lord walked with the disciples to Emmaus. What does he do? They're all depressed, they're all sad, this is the Sunday, he's risen from the dead. Some people are reporting that they've seen him, but they leave Jerusalem, they're walking to Emmaus, this stranger joins them, starts talking to them, starts explaining all the scriptures. He's explaining all the prophecies, all the different passages that apply to him, and how they've been fulfilled. And their hearts are burning within them, right? They're really excited. And then, of course, the breaking of the bread is when they recognize him, and that's when he disappears, when he offers the mass for them. But what happened to those disciples? The Cleophas. They had a lot of confidence then. They ran back and they told everyone else. And then they could take greater confidence in all the other things that our Lord told them were coming and were going to happen. Because he already understood how many of these other prophecies had been fulfilled. And so that's where we can really benefit from Catholic prophecy. Scripture, but even the private revelation, as we see it being fulfilled, we take great confidence that God will fulfill these things. Again, we do distinguish between public and private revelation. That's important. Within private revelation, we want to know how it was confirmed by a miracle, for example, by a church authority, or was it just a saint who said this? Um, even when a saint says things, remember, prophecy is a divine gift. So just because someone's a saint, meaning they exemplify heroic virtue, does not mean that they know everything, and that they never make mistakes. A saint can get things wrong, especially when it comes to prophetic things, because in order for the saint to know things about prophecy, God has to directly reveal it to them. Again, a famous example of this goes to someone like St. Vincent Ferrer, who was alive during the Great Western Schism, when the church had two claimants to the papacy. And in the end, they had three. And for a while, a lot of it, I think, had to do with his circumstances, where he's born, his life. But for, for a while, St. Vincent Ferrer is more in support of the individual, the Pope who was in Avignon, who history has deemed the anti-Pope, as opposed to the Pope who was in Rome. 
uh, St. Catherine of Siena dies, but of course we know that St. Catherine of Siena was supporting the Roman Pope, so you have like these two popes on uh, two popes, two saints on different sides, if you will. Now St. Vincent Ferrer comes around, so he does get it right in the end. In fact, he's the one who settles the dispute. So uh, it, it's you know, but at the time when let's say he's with the Avignon Pope, we could simply say, well, God has not revealed this to him, so he doesn't know, and he's sort of questioning like everyone else, and he's doing his best to figure it out on his human reason. Because sometimes people do take some kind of prophecy or some kind of vision, and instead of waiting for the church approval in the magisterium, you'll hear them say things like, well, whoever, you know, it, may, it might be St. Padre Peel said this was legit, or St. whoever it might be, Louis de Montfort, whoever. And while that carries a certain weight, certainly, it doesn't make it infallible, okay? Because again, even the saint can be wrong on Catholic prophecy, on prophecy in general. Did God give him that grace? We have to distinguish between God's word and man's interpretation. Very often we get a prophecy that's so important with scripture. Well, we know this is God's word, but we still have to interpret it correctly. You know, what's man's interpretation of it? Again, that's where we rely on the church and the gifts of the Holy Ghost. And of course, we have to discern and test it to make sure that this prophecy really is supernatural. Even though it might appear su supernatural to us, that doesn't mean it is. There's this famous example uh, with the Arian crisis. If you're familiar with that, that was a great heresy that devastated the church in the 4th century, and one of the reasons the Arian crisis gained so much currency is because the emperors, the Roman emperors, got behind it. Some of them did. Some of Constantine's sons got behind it. And so, one of the reasons one of his sons supported it greatly is because he had these two Arian bishops who were, you know, whispering the heresy, is, and basically the Arian heresy is to deny Jesus Christ as God, denies Jesus' divinity. So, I mean, this destroys the very essence of Christianity. And there was a battle I think he was fighting the barbarians, the emperor was. He's back in his palace, and they're out in what is now like Serbia, Yugoslavia, that area. And the battle took place in the battlefield, hundreds of miles away. His army won the victory. Well, the devils saw that. And these particular Aryan bishops that were in his court, and were his counselors, were possessed by devils. The devils saw the victory and instantly tell it to the bishops. And the bishops go and tell the emperor, look, if you, you basically promise to be Arian, then you're going to be granted a great victory here. And he's like, okay. And then a week later, or three days later, whatever it was, you know, the horse rider gets there, the messenger saying, that was a great victory for you, emperor. And the emperor's like, oh, wow, these guys are right. This is prophecy, and prophecy comes from God, and so I'm going to be an Arian, because the Arian God is the right one. Even though that wasn't authentic prophecy. That was something that could be known by natural reason alone, or the devils could figure it out. So that's why the discernment is very important. Prophecy can get tricky. So we always have to be on our guard against that. The simplest rule is you just follow what the church teaches, and then you can't go wrong. So what are some of the things that the church teaches? Well, there's definitely a lot having to do with the end times. We call this eschatology, things that have to do with the end of time. And so, for example, we have the four last things. All of us will die. All of us will face our particular judgment. There is also a final general judgment for all, and heaven and hell are eternal. They last forever. Souls in heaven are there forever. Souls in hell are there for eternity. That's part of the infallible teaching of the church. There's Catholic prophecy revealed by our Lord himself. What's going to happen towards the end times? Fortunately, we know a lot about what's going to happen in the end times. Here are some of the signs that the church fathers and the saints have already told us. The gospel will have to be preached throughout the whole world. There's also going to have to be a great apostasy, a falling away from the faith. These things are all in scripture, by the way. There's going to be a man of sin, who we refer to as the Antichrist. He will have to rise to world power. Elias, the prophet Elias, and Enoch, a patriarch from Genesis, will return. He actually never died. Every person must die, but Elias and Enoch never suffered death. Elias, you're familiar with, he gets taken up in a fiery chariot to heaven. Or, when I say heaven, I don't mean necessarily to be a typical vision in the presence of God, but to some place. You know, only God really knows where Elias and Enoch are alive, but they're alive right now, and they haven't died. And they're coming back, and they're coming back at the end times. And they're going to preach against Antichrist. Elias, most likely, to the Jews. Enoch, to the Gentiles. And they will fight Antichrist, and they will work great miracles, and Antichrist will hate them, and Antichrist will slay them outside the same city where our Lord was slain. So we all know that's Jerusalem. 
And that's when they die. And then the whole world is going to think more of Antichrist. But God will raise up Elias and Enoch. So they're going to then experience the resurrection. So just like all of us die, and all of us will experience a resurrection, Elias and Enoch are going to get it, but they're going to get it in a very public way for the world's benefit, for the conversion of many. The Jews as a nation will be converted. And what exactly that means is still a bit of a mystery. So we know that's going to happen, but what does that mean? The Jews as a nation, does that mean every single one? Does that, that, we don't know exactly, but we know that they, especially at that moment, when they were before Pilate, and they yell, crucify him, crucify him. We have no king but Caesar. Let his blood be upon us and upon our children. And they call down a curse on themselves. And they ceased at that point to have the covenant and abandon God. But God still loves them. And so he's still calling them back. And there will be a time where the Jews en masse in some ways will convert and come back. And come back to the true faith. They acknowledge Christ as their Messiah, as their Savior, as their King. So that's going to happen. And then we have also the Perusia, which is the second coming of Christ, where he will come on the clouds and he will slay Antichrist with the word of his mouth. The world is going to be destroyed by fire. So that's going to be the end of the world as we know it. The end of space, the end of time. They will be ended. They are created realities. Space and time are things God created. He's outside of space and time. He'll destroy those. Those are going to end. There will be the bodily resurrection of the dead. Everybody gets their body resurrected. And then, purgatory is done away with, no more purgatory, and there's a general judgment. God will judge everyone in public before. And so, even though you already face your particular judgment, the judgment doesn't change. But the general judgment now is so that everyone knows the judgment of every person and why. And that will be to the great glory of God. That's so we'll even find out things like how our little deeds of good works help other people maybe go to heaven. We'll also find out how our sins affected others. So for example, let's say someone like Martin Luther, who began many heresies, is going to find out at this general judgment just how many people fell into hell because of the heresies he started. And he'll be liable for that at the general judgment as well. But someone like the hidden grandmother who lives and lives a life of charity, faith and hope and sanctifying grace is going to find out that although maybe she was just there praying, or maybe the little Carmelite nun in her cell praying for the world is going to find out just how many people her prayers helped. And that's going to be all to the glory of God and for the glory of the saints, for the honor of Our Lady as well. So that's a general judgment. Um, and then there's also the eternal lake of fire into which, into which God will cast death. So death will be cast in there. Hell will be cast in there. The devils will be cast in this eternal lake of fire. All those who are not in the book of life will be cast in there. And then, God will create a new heaven and a new earth, which eye has not seen, ear has not heard. You don't know how wonderful that will be. So that will be for those who enjoy eternal blessedness with the beatific vision. All of this is part of Catholic prophecy. All of this is coming. We should be familiar with these things. These are principles of our faith. They're not always taught to us. Some of them are contained in the creed. Um, and I believe in the resurrection of the body, life everlasting, things of that sort. But these are all day feeding. Now we can also talk about just um, sort of like a basic outline of where we're at right now. What prophecy is more applicable to us right now? Because again, I'll give you a spoiler just to help. There are people out there who are talking. You hear them all the time on the internet or on wherever it is. We're at the end times. We're at the end times. No, no, we are not. Okay, I guarantee you we're not at the end times. And I've already given you the things that were given to us Dave Fede in the church that show us we're in the end times. Okay, if you haven't seen Antichrist rise, you haven't seen Elias and Enoch out, we're not at the end times. As in the, the end times when our Lord comes again on the cloud, the Perusia, the second coming. Okay, we're not there yet. But, history is cyclical. Okay, and there are ages, and ages come to an end. One saint I encourage you to look at is a venerable. Uh, he's not that well known. And again, this is not de fide, but I think he has a really good analysis of it, so I'll share it with you. And there's still questions with, which remain with his understanding, um, and different people take different takes, because again, that's what happens with prophecy. But I think his basic principle is very, very sound. His name is Venerable Bartholomew Holzhauser. He was a German living in the 1600s, born near Augsburg, ordained a priest in Salzburg. <laughs> 
out in an order uh, to correct lukewarm faith at the time, the customs of corrupt secular clergy at his time, and his order didn't endure, unfortunately. And his works were printed, he died in uh, 16, he died in 1658, and his works were printed till 1784, so over a hundred years after he died. But one of the things he did is he looked at the book of the Apocalypse, and he gave us an understanding of it. For example, St. John saw seven stars and seven candlesticks. And again, remember, those kinds of symbols can have a lot of different meanings. So Benevol Holzhauser gives us, I believe, one very clear meaning. And when you get a very clear meaning, that doesn't mean there's no other meaning to it, because that's the power of prophecy. So Benevol Holzhauser saw it, he says, these seven things signify seven periods in the history of the church, from its foundation to its consummation at the final judgment. He said these periods also correspond to the seven churches of Asia Minor, and they correspond to the seven days of creation, and to the seven gifts of the Holy Ghost. And so he goes through these seven periods of church history, and he explains them to you, and it's nice how he matches them up to a gift that we need from the Holy Ghost in particular, he matches them up with creation, and he's matching them up with what St. John is saying to the seven churches. So what are these seven ages of the church? Roughly, because we don't have like precise ending and ending and starting and ending dates, but he says the first one is the apostolic age. So that obviously is when the church is founded by our Lord, and it pretty much goes until the death of the apostles. So the death, you could say, of St. Peter and St. Paul. This is around the time of Nero, 70 AD more or less. What's interesting is that in 70 AD, when this age probably comes to an end, Jerusalem was destroyed. And many people thought that this looked like the end of the world. Many of the prophecies we read in Scripture by our Lord himself are about the destruction of Jerusalem and are fulfilled in that. And so then we read them, we can get confused, but that was the end of an age, an end of a time. The destruction of the temple and the complete obliteration of what is the vestiges of the Old Covenant. Okay, so that's the first age. Then you have the second age, he calls it the era of persecution. And so that's largely the age of the martyrs. And heresy also starts by the Gnostics and by the heretics, uh, the Arians. <coughs> That basically goes from about Nero, so death of St. Peter and St. Paul that time, to about the time of Constantine, maybe a little further to the fall of Rome. The fall of Rome is another very significant event because it's the end of an age. And people like St. Augustine, who were alive at that time, really kind of thought like the world was coming to an end. And so many of these signs that we see with the very, very end times are always present at the end of these ages. In other words, if you were living at the time when Jerusalem was being destroyed, you would see some of these things happening that we just talked about a minute ago. Now, you wouldn't have seen them fully fulfilled. Elias and Enoch, for example, didn't come back. But there's going to be a guy out there that looks like the Antichrist to you, namely Nero. Okay? Uh, so in these different periods, you're still seeing these types. And that's, again, what we can get a little confused with on the prophecy. So that's the second age. The third age was then called the Era of Illumination. And that's pretty much going to go from the fall of Rome, when St. Benedict began his monks. The Irish monks began to bring back the faith. It's ironic, because our history books call these the Dark Ages. But they're really the era of illumination, when the gospel was being carried to all the lands. That's when France is becoming the eldest daughter of the church, and the barbarians are converting. Okay, and so the gospel starts getting spread over what they understood to be the whole face of the earth. Again, one of those signs. Uh, and that pretty much lasts until Charlemagne is crowned, and we have a new Holy Roman Empire, sort of built upon the old Holy Roman Empire. Both secular state and church, under a good holy pope, and a good, great Catholic king that are working together. So Charlemagne and St. Leo. Pope St. Leo the second, the third? I'm forgetting which one it is. One of the Pope St. Leo's who crowns him um, on Christmas Day in 880. So that's your third era. Then the fourth era, he calls it the period of peace. And that's primarily the glorious Middle Ages. It's the civilization under Christ. It's the building of the great cathedral like Chartres in France. It's St. Thomas Aquinas writing his Summa. It's... Bernard that's gone and spread the Cistercian monasteries everywhere. Now, even though it's called the era of, pe era of peace, it's not all peaceful. You know, the Muslims are a big threat. There's also the time of the Crusades. So all that's taking place in this era. But largely, church and state are living together, and we've reached a kind of height of Christian civilization in Christ our King. Then comes the Fifth Age, which Venerable Holtzhauser calls the time of tribulation. I don't think I'm going to have time right now, but I would love to read you some of the things he says about it, because you'd be like, wow, he really did see what was going on in our time. So uh, you can do it. I'm sure if you search him on the internet, you'll find him. There's another little book. It's pretty small. It's called Catholic Prophecy by Yves DuPont. Um, I think it was written in the 1970s. And 
I wouldn't necessarily trust so much what Yves Dupont says, but I like what he does in his book because he just collects all these prophecies. He tells you like what saint gave him, what year they gave, and he gives you the prophecy. Um, and then he gives his own commentary. And his commentary is obviously colored by the fact that he's living in the 70s. There's a lot of things you can see, oh, I wonder about it. But the prophecy is still good. And so if you get those prophecies and read them, um, I think it'll give you a lot of insights. You might understand it now, given what's happening in 2023, 2024, uh, quite differently. But anyway, um, the way he describes this fifth age is really spot on to what's happening to us right now. This time of tribulation is a great revolutionary time. Um, it's the time that begins with really Luther's posting of the 95 Thesis in the beginning of the Protestant Revolution. And it's been a period that's just been racked by revolution. Protestant Revolution, Freemasonic Revolution, Communistic Revolution, a revolution against God. Now we're reaching the very revolution against God's created order, where we are no longer, where we're denying that man is man and woman is a woman. Um, I mean, that's how bad the revolution has gotten. So that's where we are right now. We are in this time of tribulation. I do think it's very clear, all the signs are sort of there, that this age is coming to an end. And that's why people are getting confused and thinking we're at the end times. Because what we really are is with the end times of this age. Then Venerable Holtzhauser says that the sixth age is what he calls the age of consolation, where there is a glorious triumph of the Catholic Church. You have a great Catholic monarch and a great Catholic pope that lead the church and the world back to a glorious kind of civilization, and the Catholic faith spreads all over the world. Most likely, this is when that prophecy is completed, that the gospel is preached to every corner of the world. And we see a kind of Charlemagne again, a great Catholic monarch. And so everything we understand is going to be changed. Life is going to be very, very different in that sixth age. And it will be a time of great peace and great prosperity, a great Catholic flourishing. So that's what we have to look forward to. When are we getting to that? You know, when, when, when do we summit that and crest into that next age? I don't know. Um, there's certainly hope to think that it could happen for our children. Maybe some of us will live to see it. They're standing here right now. I don't know that. that. That part is beyond us. We don't have that knowledge. But you really get the sense that it's, that it's coming. It's, it's impending. And then the seventh age is called the age of desolation. It's when Antichrist will rise and take over the world. Elias, Enoch, come back. And that's the time that our Lord says will be shortened, or else no one will be saved at the end of time. So that will be short. Most likely it will be about, at least the rule of Antichrist will be three and a half years, according to Catholic prophecy in the Book of the Apocalypse. So those are your seven ages. We are all in age five. And that's why I say we're not at the very end of the world. A great question, and there's discussion on this, is how long is this age six, this age of consolation? Some people think it's going to be short. Uh, there's a prophecy by Julie Jehenny that talks about 25 years of good harvest. And so some people think it could just be 25 years. And it's a short period of peace. And I really wonder, really, we're going to get that bad? And in 25 years, we're going to go right back to Antichrist? It's possible, but then again, Julie Jehenny may not be right on the 25 good harvest. And even if it's 25 good harvest, that doesn't mean it was just 25 years. I mean, you could have 100 years and 75 years of bad harvest and 25 years of good harvest. This is where the interpretation gets a little tricky. So just because she said 25 years of good harvest doesn't mean every single year was a good harvest. But can it be 500 years? Can it be 1,000 years? I don't know. Uh, some people read Venerable Holtzhauser and think it is going to be a long period. We don't know that. You know, there are these things that still remain mysterious. Um, so we'll leave that in, in, in God's hands. But those are, let's say, your seven periods. And what we see now, again, back to for us, what we need to be most aware of, um, obviously, Satan's master strategy is going to be a diabolical revolution. He wants to undermine all of God's right order and invert everything God is doing. And so what we're seeing now is in a series of almost like tidal waves, this revolution over the last 500 years in this age of tribulation has grown in intensity and universality, kind of covering the whole earth. And it's ultimately leading to what people are calling right now a kind of new world order with a false god. Where, where Satanism is accepted, uh, where the secret societies that were set against the church come to kind of power, where Zionism is on the rise. That, by the way, is another sign. They're going to try to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. If they ever do accomplish the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem, then you know we are at the end times. This is the work of Antichrist, and we're probably in that seventh period. That doesn't mean they're not going to try to do it in some of the other eras. Okay, again, those signs can always be somewhat present. In order to be effective, this revolution has to convince men that it's a good thing and that the Christian civilization of the past 
the Catholic altar, and the Catholic throne were evil, were backward, were oppressive. And that's what you see happening now. Every movie, every book, every cartoon, whatever it is, it's constantly telling you, oh, things were so bad back then. You know, the Catholics were so superstitious, and they always present bishops or priests in movies as vile people with bad morals, and it's all meant to disparage everything about the past civilization. Much of that is not true, and one has to resist those lies, even though they're constantly being pumped into us, so that we'll accept the lies of the revolution. So that we'll embrace these human values of equality and fraternity and liberty that the French Revolution unleashed in our world. So that we'll accept things like the separation of church and state. That, although this country is founded on that principle, that's not of God, that's of the devil. God wants church and state working together, both under Christ the King. Each in their special spheres, each worried about their own things, but they work together. Okay? Because the soul and the body of a man are meant to be together in society. The soul is like the church and the body is like the state. They're meant to work together. If you separate them, it's death. That's where it leads us to. So there's a lot of things that are going to change that we've accepted as good because the revolution has taught us to do that. All goodness, truth, and beauty that come from God are replaced with deceptive, secular, materialistic lies. And there's going to be a great persecution against the church. We're seeing it play out. It will intensify. And it's going to reach a climactic point. A climactic point when everything seems lost. And then God will miraculously intervene to restore his order. So we have that from a lot of different prophecies, including from our Blessed Mother. And this is why, again, we should not worry when we already, we already know. In order to get out of the fifth age and into the sixth age, which is a glorious triumph, things will have to get to a point where they look so bad, it looks like the devil is completely won and it is completely hopeless and it's over for men. And God will miraculously intervene. And everyone's going to know it's a great miracle that God is doing. And that's one of the things that's going to bring us out of that craziness that we've fallen into, because everyone is going to acknowledge that was God's work. And that's how we usher in this sixth age. Now, why does it get so bad? Obviously, it's our sin. Our sin is what's getting us getting this bad. And the worse our sin gets, the worse it gets. So, uh, it, it's bittersweet. It, it's good to hear this. It's sad to hear this, because it does get worse. It does get worse until we get back to God. But God wins, and those who are with him win, and those who persevere with him win. So that's the really good news, and that's why we want to be aware of this Catholic prophecy. And then, as we've said before, God will use a great pope and a great monarch as his privileged instruments to accomplish this great and glorious counter-revolution, which we establish as truth, goodness, and beauty in the Catholic Church. There will be a time of great peace, a time of great flourishing and glory for civilization, for the Church, the likes of which has never before been seen on the face of this earth. And that will most likely be what we call the reign of the Immaculate Heart and the triumph of the Immaculate Heart, Mary. When will that end? How quickly? Again, that's that question. I don't know how long that sixth period is. Some people think it's quick. Some people think it's longer. I'm not about to engage in that discussion. Whatever I say is just my own personal opinion, and it's really not based on much. Uh, other than maybe what I hope. <laughs> that, that means nothing. Um, this isn't even like, you know, Christian virtual hope. This is what I wish. Um, and then things will get bad again, like I said, most likely when Antichrist comes three and a half years, and then Christ comes again. So those are things still coming. The reason I know we're not at the end times is because we do have this certain prophecy from Our Lady. And it came from the message of Fatima, where she said, in the end, my immaculate heart will triumph. And the world will be granted a period of peace, and Russia will be converted. So Russia's conversion to the one holy Catholic and apostolic faith, outside of which there's no salvation, so schismatic is not conversion, not the way God and Our Lady talk. They want you in union with the church, not in schism. This conversion of Russia is going to happen fast and in a miraculous way. And it's going to stun things, stun the world. And that's going to be, I think, what precipitates this starting of the Age of Mary. But that doesn't mean before then the errors of Russia that are spreading all over the face of the earth and including wars, a possible World War III, isn't also going to cover the face of the earth. So those things may be coming, and we've got to be ready for them. But again, in the end, her immaculate heart triumphs. So right now we're in what theologians call the minor chastisement, 
not because it's small, it could still be really bad for us, but because it's not the major chastisement, which comes at the very end of time with Antichrist. Um, and we still need that glorious triumph, which hasn't happened. And that's why I know we're not at the end times. There are many strains of prophecy that kind of coalesce and show that same direction. That's why I recommend Yves DuPont, Yves DuPont's book. Um, I've also given a whole talk on these prophecies. I've got it on CD and MP3, so you can get it. You can get it from St. Vincent. You can email me. I'll get it to you um, if you want this more in detail. But, I mean, you've got visionaries like uh, Blessed Anna Maria Taiji, Mariju Jehani, uh, Elizabeth Norimora, St. Jacinta of Adama, many saints, St. John Bosco, St. Vincent Ferrer, St. Hildegard, St. Pius X, many others. And as you kind of start reading all their prophecies, it, it's pushing us in that direction that I tried to describe that things are going to get really bad, and the clergy especially are going to fall into a green apostasy and lead the people, but then we are going to come out of it. And we can look especially at prophecies by Our Lady. Uh, Our Lady of Good Success in the 1600s with Quito de Coror, very important. Uh, Our Lady of Fatima, even Our Lady at Trefontaine in Rome in the 50s, 40s, 1940s. Uh, Our Lady of Akita in Japan in the 70s. All of these, as you read her prophecies, you see them pointing in that direction. So I'm just going to conclude by reading some of them to you. So when it comes to the message of Fatima, uh, one of the books I always recommend, I think it's a great book, even 10-year-olds read it again, my kids love it, is this one called The True Story of Fatima. If you don't know that much about Fatima, it's a good book to read, it gives you a very good introduction. And you should be familiar with what Our Lady said at that time, because it applies directly to our times. I mean, this prophecy is specific for us. She shows the children a vision of hell, and after that, she explains, this was on July 13, 1917, You have seen hell, where the souls of poor sinners go. To save them, God wills to establish throughout the world the devotion to my Immaculate Heart. In many ways, that's the essence of Fatima right there. Many souls are falling to hell. We see that around us. God wants to save them, but he's going to do it through devotion to Mary's Immaculate Heart. That is the means that God has chosen because it will glorify him the most, in the most honor to his mother, and save the most souls. It's the privileged way. So devotion to the Immaculate Heart of Mary is the solution for our times, and it's the only solution. Okay, we don't have a political solution, we don't have economic, a military solution, there's only one solution for the crisis that our world and church face right now, and it's because God said so, it's devotion to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. And he wants that throughout the world. That will be the hallmark of this glorious sixth period that we're talking about. So, she then says, if, here's your condition, if people will do what I tell you, many souls will be saved, and there will be peace, and the war is going to end. She appeared in the middle of the Great War, World War I, which was destroying Christian civilization. In many ways, World War I was the worst war we ever suffered in terms of its effects and what it did to this world. World War II is kind of like World War I Part II, really, and, and it's connected to it, inevitably. Um, even though more people died, and it was sort of worse in terms of people dying and destruction, World War I did more to sort of change people's minds and get them away from God. And that's when it really appears and she promises that this war is going to end. So that's already a grace that she's given. Then she goes on to say, but if they do not stop offending God, so that's huge, we have to stop offending God. And that's what mankind is not doing right now, which is why it keeps getting worse. But if they do not stop offending God, another worse war will break out in the reign of Pius XI. And that's exactly what happened with World War II. When you see a night illumined by an unknown light, know that it is a great sign that God gives you, that he is going to punish the world for its crimes by means of war, hunger, persecution of the church and of the Holy Father. This light was actually seen on January 25th, 1938. Hitler also saw this light, and he took it as a superstitious sign that he was supposed to you know, unleash his armies. So that light was seen. Now that's not to say that there might not be another unknown light in the sky that comes around. It was prophecy and cyclical. But that certainly has already been fulfilled there. Then Our Lady says, To forestall this, I shall come to ask for the consecration of Russia to my Immaculate Heart and the communion of reparation on first Saturdays. So everyone needs to really learn that, and we have it up here, the first Saturday and the consecration, because that's the privileged way that we're going to have devotion to the Immaculate Heart. So God gives us the solution, devotion to the Immaculate Heart, and the privileged means on the global scale that only the Pope and the bishops can accomplish is the consecration of Russia to Mary's Immaculate Heart. And that has not yet happened. And on our family level, parish level, local level, 
It's the communion of reparation on first Saturday. It's the first Saturday devotion. And this will foster this devotion to the Immaculate Heart. And so what we need to do is we need to be talking to everyone about it so that we get more and more graces through the first Saturday as well as through our rosaries and other things that we're doing to fulfill what Our Lady asks to also get the grace for the Pope and the bishops to consecrate Russia to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. So she says, to forestall this, I shall come back. She does come back on June 13th, 1929, to ask for that consecration of Russia, and on December 10th, 1925, to ask for this first Saturday devotion. Our Lady continues, if they heed my requests, Russia will be converted and there will be peace. If not, Russia will spread her errors throughout the world, promoting wars and persecutions of the church. The good will be martyred, the Holy Father will have much to suffer, various nations will be annihilated. I don't think we've seen that. Various nations are going to be annihilated if we don't see offending God and do this. And I don't know what kind of time period we have, but I think it's coming to an end very quickly. In the end, she then goes on to say, in the end, my Immaculate Heart shall triumph. The Holy Father will consecrate Russia to me, Russia will be converted, and some time of peace will be given to the world. So there she's already talking about that sixth age. So those things are certain. Those are going to happen. The real question is just when it's going to happen. When you read other messages, and I don't have time to go through them because we're out of time now, but when you read things like St. John Bosco's Dream, talks about the Pope tying the bark of Peter, the Church, to the Holy Eucharist and to Our Lady. Devotion to the Eucharist and devotion to Our Lady. And that's ultimately what brings peace to the world and peace to the Church. Fatima, very focused on the Holy Eucharist and Our Lady. Same thing when Our Lady appears at Akita. In Japan, it's kind of like Fatima, a continuation. Many people, I think, rightly believe that the reason she appears in Akita is because the third secret of Fatima was not revealed in 1960, as it ought to have been. And so she comes to let us know what we need to know. Here are some of the things she says, again, on October 13, 1973, approved by the bishop, approved by the church. This is what Our Lady says on the anniversary of the miracle of the sun. So October 13th, that connects you directly to Fatima. She tells Sister Agnes, As I told you, if men do not repent and better themselves, the Father will inflict a terrible punishment on all humanity. It will be a punishment greater than the deluge. So greater than the time of Noah and the ark. That's what's headed our way if we don't cease to offend God. Such as one will have never been seen before. Fire will fall from the sky and wipe out a great part of humanity, the good as well as the bad, spare neither priests nor faithful. Here, this is my own belief, I don't believe this fire falling from the sky is anything natural. People try to say it's going to be a comet, people try to say it might be nuclear weapons, yeah, it might be those things, but I think it's part of the divine chastisement, and it's going to be supernatural, similar to the fire that fell and destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. People are going to know this is a divine chastisement. The survivors will find themselves so desolate that they will envy the dead. The only arms which will remain for you will be the rosary and the sign left by my son. The work of the devil will infiltrate even into the church in such a way that one will see cardinals opposing cardinals, bishops opposing bishops. The priests who venerate me will be scorned and opposed by their confreres. Churches and altars will be sacked. The church will be full of those who accept compromise, and the demon will press many priests and consecrated souls to leave the service of the Lord. She said this in 1973, but we're living through it. Again, this should give us great confidence. These prophecies are coming true when we're seeing them. The demon will be especially implacable against souls consecrated to God. The thought of the loss of so many souls is the cause of my sorrow. If sins increase in number and gravity, there will no longer be pardon for them. Pray very much the prayers of the rosary. I alone am able to save you from the calamities which approach. Those who place their confidence in me will be saved. She echoes much of what she says at Fatima. The importance of praying the rosary every day, that the rosary has got the greatest efficacy and can overcome any problem, that she and only she can help us. Because again, this is God's will because it's devotion to the Immaculate Heart, to her that's going to save us. Again, it ties us wonderfully into the theme we gave earlier about how Mary is so essential for our salvation. She is coming in these apparitions approved by the Church and telling us, in this time, only Our Lady, only she can help you. Only I am able to save you from these calamities. And again, it's nothing about like Our Lady being um, a 
about her, right? right? It's not about her. It's all about God, because she's trying to point us to God, to have a cease of in God, to bring about his plan. Like she says, do whatever he tells you. I am the handmaid of the Lord. Um, but this is what we are living in right now. And so the only solution for us is, you can learn a lot from all these Catholic prophecies, good sources I've given you, but it is devotion to the Immaculate Heart, and it's heeding the message of Fatima. And so the sooner we do it, and the sooner we share it with everyone we know, and we get more people living it, then the quicker we get to the sixth age. I'd like to live in that sixth age. I hope you want to live in that sixth age. I want my kids to live in that sixth age, and my grandchildren to live in that sixth age. But we got to do our part. And so a very easy way to remember the message of Fatima, and we close with this, is obviously cease offending God, and then she asks us to pray the rosary every day. So what we're doing is we're offering, I like to say, a Roman Catholic SOS. Easy to remember. We're all Roman Catholics. We're on that bark of Peter, and we're sending up this SOS, this plea to heaven. And then each of those letters stands for something. So the R is the rosary, the C is consecration, the S is scapular, the O is to offer, and the S is the first Saturday. So pray your rosary every day. Pray for the consecration of Russia. And I strongly encourage you to personally consecrate yourself to the Immaculate of Mary. Right? That's what she's saying. Those who place their confidence in me will be saved. This is the surest path to heaven. It is the best way to save your own soul and those of whom you love. So do that consecration. We actually put out a wonderful little booklet on how you can consecrate yourself to the Immaculate of Mary. It's over there on that table. Uh, we just printed it a few months ago. And then the brown scapular. Wear the brown scapular faithfully. If you, know, if you don't know about the brown scapular, we have another little booklet that explains that powerful spiritual shield in great detail, but everybody should be wearing their brown scapular all the time and living according to it faithfully. And then offer, offer your prayer, your penance, your sacrifices. You keep the Ten Commandments, your daily duty, offer them for the Pope, for the bishops, for our leaders, for the salvation of many souls, for the people you love. There's a lot we can offer, and then practice the first Saturday devotion every month. Right now we've started a, we're trying to put together a spiritual bouquet for Our Lady. We would like to give her 100,000 first Saturdays by the 100th anniversary of her request, which will be December 10th, 2025. That's 100 years of disobedience if we don't do this. And 100 years is significant. I'm not getting that, into that in this talk, but in Catholic prophecy, 100 years is significant because oftentimes that's all God gives us, 100 years to disobey him. So I don't know if things are going to get worse at the end of 2025, like really bad, when we're in this 100-year period of disobedience, as well as for the consecration, we hit 100 years on June 13th, 2029. And between those two dates, December 10th, 2025, and June 13th, 2029, is three and a half years, which in scripture is often a time of intense tribulation. I don't know if we're headed to that. I'm not a prophet, so I just say maybe. It's possible. Regardless, we need to get on it. We need to get our, our, our spiritual life in gear and do this for Saturday. So as I was saying, on our website, you can go to fatima.org forward slash 100 by 100, and you can sign up so that when you do a first Saturday, you unite it to the spiritual bouquet. And we're hoping that with 100,000 for Saturdays, we can at least mitigate or weaken any possible chastisement that may be headed our way. So please join that effort. <laughs>